Hello. This is episode 43 of This Week with David Rovix, which you can find at davidrovix.com slash thisweek, as well as on all the usual podcasting platforms if you search for This Week with David Rovix. I also have a semi-daily micro-podcast of songs related to this date in history called Song for Today, which you can find in all the same places. Okay. I was born in 1967, and for many people my age, who turned 13 in 1980 or so, I felt like I was growing up in the shadow of a massive, exciting, really earth-changing social movement that I had missed out on, what we have come to refer to as the 60s in shorthand. But as I grew up and became more and more interested in history, I increasingly came to realize that the most significant period of earth-shattering social movement activity around the world that I missed, at least as far as the 20th century goes, took place a half-century before I was born, 100 years ago, with this month, the month of May of 1919, being an especially iconic moment of the period. In many circles, particularly among labor history buffs, one-word place names are all that are needed to evoke historical battles in the ongoing thousands-year-long struggle on planet Earth between the haves and the have-nots, also known as the class war or the class struggle. Refer to cities like San Francisco or Seattle, and people think of many things, but in certain circles say the name of these cities, and General Strike will be the first thought that comes to mind, the moment in the history of these cities when the class struggle was on, and most clearly defined, and the workers were, briefly, in complete control. By the same token, in the annals of the global class struggle in the, in the industrial era, if anyone outside of Canada knows about anything about Canadian history, it can be summed up in a word and a number. Winnipeg, 1919. Being born and raised in the U.S., there is an ingrained tendency to assume that the U.S. and Canada, both being former British colonies in North America with a whole lot else in common, that history and the development of the societies in the two countries happened along similar lines. This assumption is sometimes not at all accurate, but when it comes to the first two decades of the 20th century, there was a lot of parallel stuff going on. Westward expansion in both countries, with the building of the railroads, had seen the rapid development of cities and towns throughout the west of North America. As usual, it was often those who had the least to lose who were the most itinerant, so a huge number of people were moving, who were moving out west were immigrants and refugees from across Europe. With widespread poverty, brutal exploitation of workers, massive unemployment, as well as a huge influx of immigrants, conditions were extreme in so many ways across both the U.S. and Canada. Extreme conditions tend to invite more robust responses, and this was very evident at the time, in the form, on the one hand, of a visionary, hugely popular radical labor movement, and on the other, a very violent, often obviously corrupt, openly racist, actively xenophobic, and pro-business police state. This was the socio-political context in both the U.S. and Canada for World War I. Afraid of the potential consequences, there was much disagreement within the ranks of the militant labor movement of the day over whether to oppo openly oppose this war that would pit the working classes of Canada, the U.S., Britain, France, Russia, and so many other countries against the working class youth of Germany, Austria, Hungary, and elsewhere. Ultimately, both the industrial workers of the world in the U.S. and the organization's Canadian rendition, the One Big Union, denounced the war as a boss's war. They said a bayonet was a weapon with a working man at either end. One half of Canadian draft-age men got medical exemptions to avoid military service. In many cases, this was evidence of the unhealthy state of the Canadian working class of the day, so many of whom were suffering from black lung or had other chronic health problems related to working in dangerous mines, factories, logging camps, lumber mills, and so on. But it's more likely that this statistic was also evidence of the widespread opposition to the war. In the months after the imperial bloodbath in Europe ended, the class war in Canada came to a head in Winnipeg. Both national and local authorities were actively promoting nationalism and xenophobia in their dual effort to garner support for Canada's participation in the war and defeat the organizing efforts of the One Big Union. Their claims that the Union was led entirely by immigrants and that the veterans of the war opposed the Union were bald lies, which were countered by huge rallies of immigrants together with Canadian-born Canadians, including large numbers of returning veterans. 
When the ruling class in both Canada and the U.S. decided it was time to initiate their deadly, nationally coordinated efforts to defeat radical unionism and divide the working class along immigrant and non-immigrant lines, and to whip up anti-union nationalist hysteria in the wake of the terrible sacrifices made by so many hapless members of the Canadian working class during the so-called Great War, in the midst of unrelenting ongoing repression and a continent-wide backdrop of racism, xenophobia, and nationalism, backed into a corner, with the only real alternative being to roll over and play dead, the working class led by the one big union responded. In Winnipeg, this response meant unionized and non-unionized workers walking off their jobs throughout the city and staying off their jobs for over five weeks. By the end, they had no food. The labor movement of the day was very militant and well-organized, but terribly under-resourced and constantly under siege. There was nothing close to the kind of strike fund that would have been needed, but the strike happened anyway because there was no real alternative. In the end, the forces of capitalism and repression won, killing strikers, starving them out, and forcing them back to work, if they were lucky enough to get their jobs back. Many of the basic demands of the working class in Winnipeg in 1919 were later won by future labor struggles and by political reformers elected to Parliament from the ranks of strike leaders in the years after the Winnipeg general strike. But far more than those substantial victories that came later, it is the total solidarity of basically the entire working class of the city of Winnipeg in the very physical form of the shutdown and takeover of the entire city by the workers that will long be remembered as the moment when the working class truly stood up. War came, men were drafted, many never made it back. Those who did discovered in their absence they'd got the sack. Tenements and squalor, both rats and people getting sick. What they had in common, life was short, death was quick. No one had a plan what they were going to do. When all the men came back home and the ranks of the unemployed grew, the way the people had to live was no life at all, but it still came as a surprise. How many hands at the call if you weren't there? You'll never know just what it was like when the whole city went on strike. City leaders and newspapers, in many ways they tried to do everything they could to widen the divide between good Canadians and those they called alien scum, between those who missed conscription and those who beat the war drum. But when the veterans marched in Winnipeg, they marched for everyone. Under the banner of the working class, the one big union. Everybody left their jobs, whether organized or not. Even the policemen walked away, refused to embrace the rot. If you weren't there, you'll never know just what it was like when the whole city went on strike. The mayor deputized the scabs, soon they shot two men who died in the city center on the hour when the scabs rampaged through the city attacking anyone in the street trapping people in alleyways not even allowing them to retreat soldiers occupied the city people hadn't eaten in weeks the prospects for victory began to look bleak People went back to their jobs, if indeed they even could. The bosses said they'd seek revenge, and many of them would. If you weren't there, you'll never know just what it was like when the whole city went on strike. Strike leaders were imprisoned from where several were elected to the Canadian Parliament. And a monument was erected at Main and Portage, where a streetcar was overturned, driven in by strike breakers on the spot where it was burned. It was a century ago, but life is often still defined by which side you were on. 
on that picket line? Was your grandpa shot in the heart, or did they break his leg? When the working class rose up and shut down Winnipeg, if you weren't there, you'll never know just what it was like when the whole city went on strike. If you weren't there, you'll never know just what it was like when the whole city went on strike. When the whole city went on strike. I look forward to singing that song and others this Saturday, May 25th in Winnipeg in Memorial Park for a commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the Winnipeg General Strike that labor unions and folk festival organizers are putting on. On Wednesday, May 29th, I'll be spending the day at Big Red Studio in Corbett, Oregon, recording that song and 11 others. The resulting solo acoustic album will initially be made available to my CSA members or folks who donate to my Cargo Bike Crowdfunder, both of which you can read about at davidrovix.com. Okay, this has been episode 43 of This Week with David Rovix. Hope to see you here next week.